Hello, this is Grandmaster Arthur Nations from Latvia. Uh, this time I would like to share with you one of uh, my recent victories in the Sigolda Rapid Chess Championship, which at the same time also was Latvian Rapid Championship. It was held last weekend, Saturday and Sunday, on the beautiful town Sigolda. And I scored eight uh, victories and three draws, securing the first place. So I'm usually quite happy to play in this tournament. It's quite a relaxing atmosphere. And I wanted to share with you a couple of interesting games I played in this tournament. So the first uh, interesting game happened in round four. I was leading the tournament at the moment with three points out of three. And I was playing against my old friend Denis Nikolaev, whom I played together in many youth tournaments more than 15-20 years ago. He left the active chess, but still he's quite a strong about the national master level player, and it's not always easy to play against him. So this time we played the French defense. It was a slight surprise for me. And he made an inaccuracy. After a3, I decided, okay, I just want to try this line. I mean, it's been quite many years when I played this. And he blitzed out a5, which is not exactly the best move. And here he made the first inaccuracy by playing knight f5. Uh, usually black has to take cdx on d4. Then only he has to play knight f5. And after the trade, knight c3, white is still ahead and just enjoys the better game. The point is, after knight f5, it is so tempting, but there is one major drawback for this plan. I just take on f5 and play c4. I knew this idea, but unfortunately I didn't know much anything else about it. I mean, how to play afterwards. I just remember that c4 is the computer's line, but what's the continuation here? I had no clue. So, for example, something like d takes on c4 is met by d5. Uh, knight d4, knight c3, and these pawns on d5, e5, they're really menacing. And the extra pawn for black on the c4 doesn't really play a role. And I can even at some time perhaps play a3, a4, and presumably win the pawn c4 back at some time. It's not really that relevant, but I mean, that's the general idea. So then he's believed in my approach. He played bishop e6 and rook d8. Here I spent quite some time trying to understand how can I seize any advantage here. So I came up with the best I could. I start to open the position because black is behind in development. And I mean, the logic dictates I should be the one who is opening the position and try to exploit my advantage in development. So that's what I did. I was also thinking about rook c1 here idea, but... I mean, I could not understand if this is enough. Uh, something like bishop e7. And I was slightly concerned that maybe, maybe it's not enough. So I play queen b1, targeting the pawn on f5. And after queen e4, I came up with this idea to play rook d1 with a threat to play rook takes on d5 and queen takes on f5. And black still doesn't have time to finish the development. The pawn on e5 is irrelevant. Black cannot really take it at any given time because of the such exposed king. It will automatically get a very dangerous attack on the e-file. So he played the natural moves. Rook d1, queen d1, bishop e7. And after queen b3, suddenly he is in even greater trouble. The pawn on b7 is, is lost, essentially, because yet again black cannot really take on e5. Uh, he cannot protect the pawn on b7, and he has to rush with the development of the king and bring it to the safety. So that's what I, well, that's what he did. And after queen b7, rook b8, queen c7, rook b2, I could have secured my big advantage if I had played correctly after knight d2, with two very dangerous threats. One threat is to play rook c1, targeting the knight on c6, which is also protecting the bishop on e7 and the second threat is lure away the queen from e4 guarding the pawn on f5 by giving a check on c8 taking the pawn on f5 and securing advantage and yet another point is i protect against the threat rook b2 rook b1 check well for some reason i mean i i saw this idea in id2 but i just did not play it at this right time and i made a mistake by playing rook e1 because I was hallucinating that something is going to happen after rook b1. 
and presumably after here I was thinking some tactics work with e6 but to be honest the, nothing works really here and actually I'm already much much worse I cannot obviously I cannot play e6 because I lose by force but after bishop f8 I'm just worse and a funny moment happened here is that um, after bishop d8 which is a mistake now the position is yet again equal <laughs> For some reason I was hallucinating and I yet again was concentrating on the threat of knight e2 so that the queen on e4 is overloaded by guarding the knight on c6 and guarding the pawn on f5 that I simply forgot that I have an option to play knight d4 which essentially ends the game. So knight e4 and the bishop on d8 is taken with a check. Well, okay, to be honest, I mean black did make this mistake by playing king f8 before, one move before, but... Now I could have played knight d4 and win the game, and after queen d7, queen c2, I could have yet again played knight d4 and win the game on the spot. But yet again, I was so focused by winning this pawn on a 5 that I just, yeah, somehow it skipped my attention. And here happened yet another funny thing, that after I played e6, f takes on e6, yet another hallucination happened. <laughs> I had intended to play queen e6, and suddenly I... Notice that after queen d1, king h2, bishop c7, I lose the knight on f3 because after g3, queen f3, black presumably is a piece up and the knight on c6 is protected. So I skipped this line. I thought, okay, this is unplayable. But should I calculate one move forward after bishop c5, white effectively wins the game. So yeah, that was quite, I don't know what that was, some complete blackout. So suddenly I believed in the move queen d6 check with the idea if black plays immediately king f7, there is this very nice idea of fork, right? Yeah, it's nice for the rapid game and all. But now the difference is that after bishop d, uh, queen d6 check, bishop e7, I thought now he cannot give me this check on d6 because I had seen that after queen d1, king h2, if he gives a check, I just play g3. And if he takes, now I take this bishop, presumably with a great position. Of course, immediately I notice that after queen d1, king h2, he can give a check with a queen. So essentially I just not only lose all of the advantage, but I also lose the pawn on a3. So that was quite hilarious, not to say even sad. I was completely losing afterwards, but I somehow managed to escape uh, with a draw. Uh, yeah. Uh, so the next game was against, I'm sorry, not, not this one. Uh, so the next game was against uh, Vladimir Sveshnikov. Uh, at that time, he was the leader of the tournament. Um, after the first day, he was leading the tournament with six points out of six. I was in the second place with five and a half out of six. Obviously, I, I wanted to win. And I spent some time thinking how to play for the win because against e4, c5, which I usually play for the win, he plays the Lapin variation, which is very difficult to beat. e4, e5, he can play the four knights variation, which is yet again very drawish. And I had no doubts he'll definitely try to play it safe, not blatantly for the draw, but play it safe and not go for any risk because for him a draw is very good. So I came up with the idea to play the... Uh, the Scandinavian. I thought that's okay, quite unbalanced. Okay, maybe it's not exactly the best opening, but for the rapid game, it's fine. So he played the main line, and here, yet again, uh, it proved that I was right. Instead of the main lines, bishop d2, queen e2, and long castle, he opted for a safe continuation. Short castle, but okay, it's just a fine line. And I got a very good playable position, I was quite happy. Here the critical moment arrives when I made a uh, error in my judgment. I played knight e5, which is supposedly a normal move, but the problem is after this move there is no way I can play for the win. I should have tried either play b5, and probably he would have went for knight e5, takes, takes, knight e5, takes, takes, although it's very little, but I can hope to conjure something at the queen side. Or the second idea might be that I could play queen b6, 
and simply play rook d8 and presumably try to push c6 c5 at some time. Still the position is quite equal, but with chances for both sides. So I would be quite happy to play this position, given uh, taking into account the fact that I'm the one who needs to play for the win. But I played knight d5. And essentially this position reaches to some kind of a Carlsbad structure. And I had this idea to execute it similarly like in the Carlsbad. I play on the on the queen side, try to create a weakness on either c3 or c2, then push it somewhere and presumably do not mess with the king side. But in reality, I realize it's easier said than done. Because now natural, I do not want to trade any more pieces. And after knight f6, rook h3, which is a very powerful move, I realized I'm the one who needs to be accurate. So I was trying to conjure some counterplay. I realized I need to set up this position for black. I want to play g6, bishop f8, bishop g7. And presumably put the knight on f5. There is no way I can do this at any given moment. Because as soon as I play g6, I have to watch out for knight f7 threats. I have to watch out for bishop g5 threats, for queen f3 threats, and the pawn on f7 is always weak. So it became increasingly difficult for me to play, and I managed to blunder a pawn in the end. So here, yeah, after bishop g5, I lost the pawn, and I had to escape to a position without the pawn, but... Uh, yeah, but uh, still sort of a playable position. So definitely this not, was not what I was intending for, but being a pawn down, but still my bishop sort of compensates, sort of. I mean, the knight, uh, the knight bishop usually sort of slightly better. I was trying to push these pawns forward at the queen side, and somehow I managed to escape with the draw in the end, uh, because the time control for the tournament was 10 minutes plus 5 seconds. No, I'm sorry, 12 minutes plus 5 seconds. So at, somewhere around this time, Vladimir was already playing on the increment, so for him it was... Not so easy to convert extra pawn, and yeah, he blundered a pawn somewhere, so we played the draw. So in the end, it turned out this was the crucial game. Despite the fact I was still trailing behind my opponent by half a point, I did not lose the game, so I had my chances to overtake him at the later stages when we would meet our other competitors. So this is exactly what actually happened. Yeah, uh... So the next game was probably the crucial, most crucial game of the whole tournament. I was playing against Roland Berzinch, international master, whom I've played many times. Uh, I've been winning him pretty much on every occasion lately, uh, so for him I'm a very un uncomfortable opponent. So he played out the, the London. Okay, he included knight of three first and played bishop of four. Yeah, I didn't want to play the Queen's Indian after b6, bishop b7, which is my usual approach. So I played d5, e3, bishop d6. Yeah, I decided, okay, I'm gonna play it quiet. It doesn't mean I want to draw. Just let's see what happens. If he takes on d6 or re retreats to uh, g3, both are vi completely playable plans. And he played knight d2. So I felt this is like a opportunity for me because I simply can double up his pawns for no good reason and play b6 so yet again the idea is is to exchange the other bishop on a6 and then presumably try to at some time create some pressure on that four point obviously the pawn, uh, the position is completely equal there's absolutely no advantage for white because he cannot generate the typical counterplay for white uh, with a bishop d3, knight e5, after I make a short castle, and then presumably some big attack is going on there. So, the question is, why did white actually double the pawns on f4, right? So he tried this trick with a queen a4 check. I do not want to lose my piece on a6. I made a castle here, 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 here. And I believe here he offered me a draw. He played queen a4. I mean, there's no way I would agree to draw here because I, I believe I'm not worse. I thought I'm only the one who can play in here for the win, although the position objectively is equal. So I play queen c8. Uh, yeah, b4 was a very strange move, so that really surprised me. I could not understand why do you do this. And after c5, I was expecting, I was expecting him to play b5 something, but okay, he took on c5. 
plate castle and 97 and the critical moment here was that I was very happy to play c4 because I realized that only I'm the one who can play for the victory here because this pawn on c3 essentially is very weak the knight on d2 is not gonna help it and I just need somehow try to exchange the queen so that I can bring my, one of my knights to a4 and the other knight to b5 which can be supported by the pawn on a6 and I can get rid of this knight by simply playing f6 and the pawn on e6, this weakness is completely irrelevant as the white knights are completely useless. So that was at least my big idea here. So after a4, f6, I was expecting him to play something like knight c6. So I thought, okay, I mean, I can just trade it. And presumably somehow try to also trade queens because a4, a5 is a threat. So I was thinking something like queen c8, take take and then presumably try to um, play something like knight e6 there are no penetration squares for the rooks all of the squares will be guarded and then I can try to uh, attack this pawn on c3 maybe at some time later bring the king to e f7 e7 maybe trade a couple of rooks on the b file so I thought I'm only the one who is playing for the win uh, he surprised me he played knight g4 and I was trying to rearrange my knights. I believed I'm the one, I mean, who is pushing here already. So I was quite happy to have both rooks, uh, uh, I'm sorry, both knights on the board. So a5, I felt, is only in my favor because here I can now play knight c7, knight b5, protect the knight, and this pawn on c3 is so weak. The knight on d2 is completely doing exactly nothing i mean i cannot imagine where do you want to position the knight now here roland suddenly believed in the move f5 i felt it shouldn't be nothing really because i mean i can easily play knight c7 f takes knight e6 still those knights on g4 and d2 are completely useless and i can rearrange the other knight to b5 but then again i felt okay it's simply an extra pawn i was not really so concerned of the rookie seven threat so i just took the pawn and after rook e7, I made a mistake. Apparently, after queen d8, knight e3, and knight e6, white simply loses material. Yeah, I just did not see this. Because I'm attacking the rook. Uh, the rook has nowhere to go. Rook a7, knight b5 is a fork. I'm sorry. Yeah, and after knight e5, knight b5, suddenly I win some material because the white's queen is under attack. Well, I did not see this. I play queen d6. I thought that is the most natural response. And after knight e3, I made another mistake, knight c7, and my opponent missed this very nice shot. Rook takes on g7. I cannot take it with the knight because the queen on d6 is hanging. I cannot take with the king because knight f5 is a fork. So essentially, I mean, I have to play king h8 and the worst position. But okay, it's a rapid game. Both of us missed this opportunity. He took on a 5, which is the natural move. I took on a 3. And here I could have secured advantage for me by playing rook f7, rook a1, and simply king f8. Something like this, and knight b5. And like I said, this pawn on b5 is extremely weak. And my pawn on d5, black, uh, white has no absolute counterplay on it. It looks quite menacing. I mean, this checks and rook e7 something. But I mean, I can even play something like king f8. The pawn on c3 is still under attack. The pawn on a7 is guarded at the moment. There's this g6 threat. Yeah, definitely not rook g7. Uh, but I misplayed it anyway. There was a complete hallucination for me. I decided to play rook c7. I just completely missed that after rook e1, um, after rook takes on e7 that he is not supposed to take with rook he is supposed to take with the knight yeah well what can I say so I simply blundered the pawn for nothing and he has the better pieces now he starts to, uh, to play for the checkmate and I was trying to complicate matters for him as much as possible so I decided okay now I'm ready to give up you a second pawn I played h5 with the idea that if he takes I play king h6 and there's some knight of five threats. The knight on d5 is not feeling so great. And as soon as it leaves, I can take on c3. And my 
C pawn might be rolling forwards. So that was the idea at least. So he played correctly, knight f4 check, king h6. I thought he's gonna play knight h5 and I would play something like knight c3. He can take the pawn on g7, I mean it's no big deal, at least. I mean that that's how I saw, I mean the only chance for me to continue, I want to play knight d5 and c3 c to go to the queens. So I felt this is the best practical chance for me. He played correctly, he played g5. Knight e6, yet again, yet again a good move, rook g8, only move, h takes, king g6. And uh, I believe he should have, no, knight f3 is a good move. And he should have taken the pawn on a7, create for him a second passed pawn. He felt it very tempting to give a check on, on g6. And suddenly he lost control. By the way, around here, I believe, I offered him a draw. Here, I believe I played knight c3, I offered him a draw. I realize I am I have a worse position. I did not believe I have a losing position. Uh, but I felt that I give him this opportunity to bail out in this complicated position because I felt I have completely misplayed it. And uh, I mean, I did blunder this uh, rookie one, a 97 idea before. So I felt, okay, if I'm blundering this game, it would be a great idea to offer a draw early on. And I felt it's also holding a psychological edge because if my opponent declines a draw, he continues to play, and then presumably later he become, uh, gets into trouble himself. He might revisit this moment yet again in his head that I did offer a draw before, so it's part of a psychological game as well. Yeah, and he misplayed it here, and suddenly he was in trouble. After knight e6, he missed, he cannot take on c3 because of the knight e4 fork. Now the game became very sharp because we were both low on time, something that maybe last 30 seconds for both of us. Uh, he made a uh, decisive mistake here by knight e4. And now the funny thing is now I have my h4 rolling forward. I ignore the knight on c5. He cannot really take it because the rook on d6, uh, d6 is played so awkwardly. I'm sorry. <laughs> and now a critical moment arose here. Rookie to check is correct because I do not want to give up my rook on e8 for nothing really. So for example, something like h2, here, here. Now I'm not even sure I can even win this. Probably I can, but uh, I felt that this g8 check is quite annoying uh, threat with the help of the knight and the rook and the king supposedly is far away. There are not so many checks. I was not so sure. I mean, I had like 20 seconds on the clock. And yeah, so I, I safeguard my rook. Now I play h2. Here, here. I calculated this to be easy win. And he played the last trick, knight g3. And I took the knight, obviously. And after g7, I, <laughs> I did not realize I can simply queen. Here, queen, g8 check. Looks quite dangerous. But simply after king f2, my king is in the safety, and with the help of the rook, queen, and knight, I should easily checkmate this poor king on c3. I mean, yeah, I just did not even think it's possible, I mean, to go allow for him to go into queens with the check. So I automatically played rook e8. He gave me a check. And here I discarded king takes on f3, which apparently is possible. Because I very quickly calculated after rook f6 check, for example, king g3, he suddenly plays rook f8. And I realized, oh my god, I mean, this g8 queen is a very big threat with the check. But apparently, computer calmly announces that after knight e4, knight f6, I easily win. I mean, I did not see this at all. So that's quite an amazing resource. Yeah, and uh, I played king f2 here, uh, and I did not have anything better than to give up the h2 pawn, otherwise he gives a lot of checks. So essentially this position I believe is drawish, because the white king is so active and the pawns are so menacing moving forward, but my opponent was so nervous and spending so much time, and in the end he lost the game on time. Yeah, so you have to keep the nerves in the most critical tension, uh, critical uh, moments so that you do not lose your head and my opponent did not manage to do that and he suffered a loss. So that was quite um, 
interesting game. And the next one, I just want to show the most crucial moment of the penultimate round. I was playing against uh, Salome Zaksaite uh, from Lithuania. And she misplayed opening. I played my pet line e4, c5, knight f3, e6, g3, which I recently wrote a database for modern chess regarding the how to treat the various anti-approaches against uh, uh, Paulsen. And, okay, she misplayed the opening. I want to show you the opening part. And she played knight a5. So I was very happy, obviously, to find bishop e7. Even if she did not play knight a5, it's quite apparent that black is suffering. I was expecting for her to play something like b7, b5, but then she simply loses the pawn. Yeah, she played knight a5, and after bishop e7, she missed. She cannot play rook e8, because I take take, and there's this double attack, even a triple attack. I might draw it. Yeah, on h6 is also a possibility to take, but I mean, I'm simply winning a piece. So she gave up this exchange for a pawn and took on c4. Presumably it doesn't look anything great. And I was very happy, I'm very proud of myself, that I managed to find this very powerful move, rook c1. So why do not play at b3? Because after knight b6, she manages to reroute the knight on d5. And it's not going to be easy, I mean, to convert this position. Probably it is a technical win, but there is a lot of game ahead. So after rook c1, she cannot go knight b6 because now I penetrate her back rank by playing rook c7 at the pawn on b7 falls. So she took on b2, knight, e, knight a4. And now black doesn't have access to this blockade on d5. And rook c7 is a very annoying threat. And by the way, the pawn on b7 and a6, they are just falling. So she resorted to the last trick available. She played knight e5. And bishop e8, that was the big idea. To pin the pieces, and presumably the idea was that after rook c to d1, she could play something like knight c3, I don't know. Although I don't think it works really. Yeah, but I found a very nice continuation, bishop c6. And after rook d2, bishop takes on e8. So I'm now pretty much up an uh, extra piece. So yet another nice bonus, what you can always do in position with the extra material, you can always play for the checkmate. So the rook, the knight and the bishop easily uh, checkmates the uh, black king and the white is also upper material, so black decided to call it quits and resign. So these were a couple of my most enter entertaining games in the tournament. There were a couple of more, but I felt these were the crucial moments. And uh, I scored my uh, third victory in this tournament, first time in 2015, then in 2017, and, and this year. So every two years I win this tournament, although I did not play this uh, tournament in 2016 and 18. Yeah, that's it. I mean, uh, thank you for watching me, and I hope you enjoyed this video. Please do not forget to subscribe to my channel. I'm trying to expand it. There are going to be a lot more videos, a lot more analysis and interesting tidbits from various uh, chess moments. Please subscribe to the channel. Continue following me and see you very soon.